Okay, we are in session eight of the book of Leviticus. We're going to try to address this evening three chapters, 13, 14, and 15. It has been our style over many decades to try to tackle the Bible expositionally a chapter a week, verse by verse. And there are some exceptions where we will bite off a few extra chapters to, in the interest of, of just keeping it moving and not, not, not getting bogged down on the detail. Well, we're going to take 13, 14, and 15 of Leviticus tonight, all of which deals with the same topic, essentially, and that's leprosy and diseases. And, of course, for many hundreds of years, the dreaded disease of leprosy killed countless millions of people in Europe alone. George Rosen, in his history, summarizes that leprosy cast the greatest blight that threw its shadow over the daily life of medieval humanity. Fear of all other diseases taken together can hardly be compared to the terror spread by leprosy. Not, e not even the Black Death in the 14th century or the appearance of syphilis toward the end of the 15th century produced a similar state of fright. Early in the Middle Ages, during the 6th and 7th centuries, leprosy began to spread more widely in Europe and became a serious social and health problem. It was an endemic, particularly among the poor, and it reached a terrifying peak in the 13th and 14th centuries. And of course, another plague that we all heard about is the Black Death, that, uh, which made the Dark Ages really dark. In the 14th century alone, this killer took the lives of one in four persons in Europe. It's an estimated total of 60 million people. It was the greatest disaster ever recorded in uh, human history. Again, quoting from the history, says, Sweeping everything before it, this plague brought panic and confusion in its train. The dead were hurled pell-mell into huge pits, hastily dug for the purpose, and putrefying bodies lay about everywhere in the houses and streets. The sexton and the physician were cast in the same deep and wide grave. The tester and his heirs and its executors were hurled from the same cart into the same hole together. Wow. I might mention, in passing too, this was also the first recorded use of biological warfare. There are actually cases where they took some of the diseased, putrefying bodies and catapulted them over the wall as a form of warfare. Not very often, not a big deal, but it is generally noted in most military histories as the earliest recorded use of what technically would be called biological warfare. But anyway, we move on. Well, what brought these major plagues of the Dark Ages under control. You wonder about that? These were terrifying, widespread diseases. And finally, and in those days, the physicians of the day had all these theories. I'm going to spare you listing them all because they're ridiculous. Everything from ast astrological alignments of planets, they, they dreamed up all kinds of screwball conjectures as to what was causing this dark, dark cloud on humanity. Well, finally, what happened? Leadership was taken by the church. As physicians had nothing to offer, the church took it as its guiding principle the concept of contagion as embodied, guess where? In the Old Testament. This idea and its practical consequences are defined with great clarity of all books in the book of Leviticus. In fact, chapter 13. Once the condition of leprosy had been established, the patient was so segregated and excluded from the community. Very simple idea. And it, it was that practice, as they began to realize how effective it was, it didn't help the people that were, you know, it's a form of triage in effect, uh, but it, it, it halted the plague. And it's very interesting to contrast the plague of the leprosy and the plague of the Black Death of the Dark Ages with HIV today. That's why some of the books on that subject are called the unnecessary epidemic. This politically protected disease is virulent, wiping out major portions of the Earth's population due to mismanagement, not applying basic hygiene, isolating those that have it, not letting them commingle with those, with those that are, are uh, clean and so forth. Following the precepts laid down by Leviticus, the church undertook the task of combating leprosy. It accomplished the first great feat in the methodical eradication of the disease. And these came out of Leviticus, chapter 13, particularly verse 46. And other, many other uh, historians besides uh, 
uh, Rosen uh, credit the Bible for draw the dawning of a new era in the effective control of disease. The laws against leprosy in Leviticus 13 may be regarded as the first model of sanitary legislation. Tragedy is it was thousands of years too late, in a sense. Or, and now it was in 1873 that... Uh, G. Armhauer Hansen, a Norwegian, discovered that a bacillus that was common in nearly all kinds of leprosy and, in fact, in proportion to the severity of it. And so, therefore, leprosy today is called Hansen's disease. Well, you say, G. however interesting this may be historically, why is this in the Bible and why is it, what practical use is it of us today? Did God put this in here for the plagues in Europe, I don't think so. Well, if we had applied it sooner, there would have been less people killed, but it, it served some other purpose. That key topic here, the real topic, is not leprosy as we think of it. Because the term here, we'll discover, is used for a whole group of diseases that are similar to that. The, the, the real subject of tonight's study is not leprosy, it's sin. It's sin. The hopelessness and the filthiness of sin are dramatically portrayed in, in the uh, idiom of leprosy. The leper that trudged down the hot, dusty road crying out, unclean, unclean, was a reminder to all the Israelites that they too were moral lepers and needed supernatural cleansing. Sin is exceedingly sinful. That's the underlying theme of the chapters we've been through with the offerings and the blood and all that. And that's the underlying message in tonight's study. Psalm 38, to select, take a few selected verses out of Psalm 38. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. For I will declare mine iniquity, I will be sorry for my sin. It goes on. That's just a, a little sampling. Psalm, Psalm 38. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6. For the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. But all of these things Christ bore for our purpose. Remember in Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Well, some way, wait a minute, are we talking about leprosy or sin? Well, let's hear what Peter says about this. First Peter 2, 24, speaking of Christ, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes Ye are healed. He's using that healing term not to refer to sickness, although it certainly he does that too, but of the more serious disease that we're all uh, subject to. It's genetically transmitted disease called sin. Our problem is not that we are HIV positive. Our problem is that we're SIN positive. If there were no sin, there would be neither death nor sickness on the planet Earth. That's the, that's the reality. Now, there's a couple of premises we want to put right up front as we go into the study, and that is, first, the Bible does not concur with the view that leprosy was incurable in that day. There are different scholars that argue both sides. It doesn't matter, because that's not the issue we'll see quickly. Cleansing is mentioned in uh, Leviticus 13.2. And there were supernatural cures, such as Naaman, the Syrian uh, officer that was uh, healed of leprosy in 2 Kings 5. Some expositors on the book of Job feel the primary thing Job was suffering was leprosy. And it probably was in the connotative sense. The term can be used denotatively, as we mostly do. It also can be connotative on that group of diseases that we'll talk about. And by the way, this book, the Torah, in general, and the book of Leviticus in particular, is not a scientific treatise on the detection, prevention, and cure of leprosy. That's not what it's about. These chapters do not contain a cure for leprosy. It gives instructions to a priest how a case is to be diagnosed or determined and the measures to be taken to prevent its spreading. Understand its focus here. The rituals we're going to read are ceremonial, not curative. 
They weren't intended to cure the disease. They were intended to isolate it and to deal with its celebration once it is cured, by the way. The uh, leper was ceremonially cleansed after he had been cured. We're going to read about it, but the presumption of the ceremony is that he's been cured. You follow me? Don't presume that the blood, this and that, are the things that are necessarily curing him. Well, Leviticus 13, let's first of all talk about how you diagnose a new case. Chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. Now these diagnostic procedures you're going to read about it are going to sound pretty crude by our standards. But this was a religious ritual, not a diagnosis for treatment. There are three symptoms dealt with here, a rising or a boil, a scab or small tumor, or a bright spot. These are suggestive but not conclusive. He was to be brought to the high priest. As we should be, as we're going to go through this, let's realize that our real focus is not the Old Testament, it's today. Who's our high priest? We are to pray to our high priest about everything, not just those three particular symptoms. And in Hebrews 4 and 7, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we talk about leprosy here, it's a very dramatic, shocking, but deliberately chosen type of the Holy Spirit for sin. We'll get into that. And we're down to verse 3. We're making progress. And the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of the flesh. And when the, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight is be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. See, if the lesion began to disappear, the person was dismissed. But if, uh, if the hair turned white, it was becoming dead, and it showed that the, the disease was beneath the, the skin and he would pronounce him unclean. Now our great physician, Jesus Christ, has also made a thorough inspection of us. And he's made his diagnosis. You ready for it? You'll find it in Romans chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Can you visualize Jesus having you stick out your tongue, putting you in a pressure, doing it like a doctor would, diagnosis? He says, their throat is an open sepulcher, their tongues that they have, that they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. I'm not talking about leprosy, he's talking about sin, but you see the parallelism. And so he has a stick out her tongue and he finds what? Deceit and lying. You and I are spiritual lepers. And that's what this is really all about. Leprosy is a type of sin for at least seven reasons. It becomes overt in loathsome ways. There's nothing secret about leprosy. When somebody has leprosy, pretty soon everybody knows it. It's pretty conspicuous in very, very offensive ways. It's a horrible disease. Leprosy from all diseases had been selected by the Holy Spirit as a, to stand as a type of sin. So we shouldn't be surprised here. It was chosen for that purpose, for this passage. Also, it begins in a small way and yet finally deals a death blow. All drunks start with one drink. All sin starts with one step. Lenin, Stalin, and Hitler at one time were cute, cuddly little babies that everybody admired. So you see a newborn baby and it's wonderful to be with a mother and her first, you know, her new child and that's exciting. But she's brought a sinner into the world. Left untrained undisciplined, that baby will grow up to be as horrible as you can imagine, but for the time and energy and effort and chastising and disciplining that we deal with. Sin, progress, sin and leprosy both progress slowly, but surely. In the leprosy case, it can be 10 or 20 years before death. And uh, to have a description of this, it comes by only by degrees, it comes on by degrees, in different parts of the body, the hair falls from the head and eyebrows. The nails loosen, decay, and drop off. Joint after joint of the fingers and toes shrink up and slowly fall away. 
The gums are absorbed, the teeth disappear, the nose, the eyes, the tongue, the palate are slowly consumed. And finally, the wretched victim sinks into the earth and disappears. And I'm sparing you. You'd be glad I'm not using PowerPoint tonight with pictures. You really don't need that, I think. James 1.15 says, When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Same, same situation. Slow, growth, certain, death. Leprosy is a living death. The person is treated as dead, uh, as a dead man from the beginning. Leprosy goes beyond pain. One of the strange things about it, it's not painful in the traditional sense. That's why it can go so, get so advanced without really be realizing it. The absence of pain is one of its characteristics. However, it keeps the person sad and restless. Man, take a look at our culture. The restlessness, the craving for entertainment, the clubs, the, the, the stuff that people do out of desperation with life. Ephesians 4.10 who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And also as 1 Timothy 4 says, a conscience seared with a hot iron. Leprosy was thought by them to be hereditary. That's debatable, but that's neither, that, that was the way it was perceived by the people. Sin certainly is. Sin certainly is. It, it comes from a genetic defect we all share. Leprosy and sin both separate from God. Isaiah 59, 2, But your iniquities have separated uh, between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And remember in Revelation 21 and 22, we have the new Jerusalem, that what? It'll shut out the unforgiven and the unwashed sinners. 21, 27, and 22, 15. Well, let's move down to verse 4. We're making progress. If the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and the sight in, in sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof not turned white, then the priest shall shut him up that hath the plague for seven days. You're going to notice all through here, there's no rush to judgment. There's no haste here. God is slow to anger. Praise God that he is. And in Exodus 34, 7, it says, the Lord passed by and before him proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty of visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the ch and upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. One of the things as you develop an increased maturity as a Christian and an increased maturity in the Bible, you'll develop an increased um, hatred of sin. And as you do that, you'll begin to appreciate more and more the incredible graciousness of God. It's, I remember I had some secular friends when the Ten Commandments came out many, many years ago, but when they saw the Ten Commandments movie, they couldn't get over how this people, who apparently had all these miracles, this parting of the Red Sea and all that stuff, and it wasn't long they were into the golden calf thing. And they were just shocked. How could those people who saw all those things Fall into that, you see. I suppose you could say by democracy. They took a vote, you know. But, but you know, it's interesting that um, it really is astonishing when you look at things through God's perspective, how patient he really is with us. Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Well, let's move on to verse 5. And the priest shall look upon him the seventh day, and behold, if the plague in his sight be a, at a stay, and the plague spread not in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. Well, that's interesting. He's waited seven days, he inspect him again, and it hasn't gotten worse. Okay, you get another seven days. This is all good news. See, we also, what do you learn from this for us? How do you apply it to us? Well, we, got, we should be careful not to rush into judgments ourselves. We, we shouldn't be hasty and rash in when we're judging other people. It's a really serious thing to bring a false charge against a believer. And I have to tell you candidly, one of the most disturbing uh, events that tends to punctuate our days in the ministry is dealing with situations that are ruled by hearsay. People who have been injured in the ministry 
by hearsay, unconfirmed rumors. It's astonishing to see how widespread the administration or management of ministries are done without the benefit of due process, without the benefit of being confronted by your accusers, by just gossip. But uh, let's move on. 1 Timothy 5, 19, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. There are many sharp pastors that refuse to hear a complaint about one of their staff unless that staff member is present. Man, that sounds like some, something out of secular corporations. Yes, it is. But it's sound ethics. It's sound governance. And that's also scriptural. That's what Paul's telling Timothy to do. But there's even a more explicit procedure in Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Then you get to the third step. And if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it to the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen, and as a publican. In other words, cast out of the fellowship. Three-step procedure. It's astonishing to see how many organized religious organizations will argue, well, that doesn't apply to us. They have some contrived, elliptical nonsense. It's exactly what it's all about. <laughs> I had fun with Walter Martin once. I was on his board. I remember, I remember that look on his face to this day. Between board meetings, he'd come up to me and says, boy, do you know what Chuck Smith was a prominent pastor in Southern California, as many of you know. You know what Chuck Smith said last Sunday? Some little tidbit he picked up that he surprised him. I stopped him mid-sentence. I said, well, gee, Walter, what was, what was Chuck's reaction when you shared that with him? He looked at me sort of startled. But, Walter, I know you're too scriptural to be sharing that with me without having first taken it to him in accordance with Matthew 18. I knew he hadn't. I'm just pulling his leg. I just turned it. I knew I had him, so I was twisting the knife, you know. He looked at me with that impish smile that only Walter could do. He said, I can see I'm going to have trouble with you too. <laughs> no, it was funny because you, you could not catch Walter on, on a misstep of that kind very often. This was done very casually, very lightly, but I, I, took, I jumped on it to take advantage and, and had fun with him on that. It was just a little, a little bit of boardroom levity. Anyway, let's go on to verse 6. And the priest shall look upon him again the seventh day, and behold, if the plague be somewhat dark, and if the plague spread not in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. What blessed words. Why? Because if he's unclean, it's nightmares. You'll see in a minute. It is but a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. See, if the plague had not spread for 14 days, but improved at least measurably, it was obviously not leprosy, and uh, he was pronounced clean. But if the scab spread, verse 7, if he spread much abroad in the skin after that he had been seen of the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen of the priest again. And if the priest see that, behold, the scab spreadeth in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. Dreaded words. He's excluded from the congregation. Not always, but usually on a path to death in slow pieces. When this final verdict <laughs> rendered, it must have been dreadful. And it's like sin. See, sometimes... People can stand inspection for a while, but eventually the priest will pronounce him unclean. Eventually your sin find, finds you out. First John 2, 9, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. In 2 Peter 2, 22, which quotes Proverbs 26, 11, Peter says in his second letter, But it's happened unto them according to a true proverb, proverb the dog is returned to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And uh, how true it is how many people would seem to turn around in a fellowship. They seem like they're on track, and yet sooner or later, the real circumstances come out. Well, what do you do now? That comes the next topic, and what do you do about a chronic case? How well, do you diagnose a chronic case of leprosy? Verse 9, when the plague of leprosy is in a man, then he shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall see him. And behold, if, it, if the rising be white in the skin, and if it have turned to hair white, and there be a, a quick raw flesh in the rising, it is, a, it is an old leprosy of the skin of his flesh, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean, and shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. <laughs> One can argue that there are a lot of polished people in many fellowships that uh, don't believe they have leprosy. 
You know, the hardened sinner is easier to reach than some of these self-deluded, slick guys. The hardened sinner is open. He knows he's a sinner and he's, you can confront him. Anyway, moving on, verse 12. If a leprosy break out abroad in the skin, and the leprosy cover all the skin of him that hath the plague from his head even to his foot, uh, wheresoever the priest looketh, then the priest shall consider. And behold, if leprosy have covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean, and that hath the plague, and if it is all turned white, he is clean. But if the raw flesh appeareth in him, he shall be unclean. And the, pre the priest shall see the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean, it is a leprosy. Or if the raw flesh turn again and be changed into white, he shall come unto the priest. And the priest shall see him, and behold, if the plague be turned unto white, the priest shall pronounce him clean. He hath the plague is unclean. See, one of the things about this passage implies that they're not all hopeless. They may not have understood the, you know, the bacteriological aspects of it, but they, there, were, there were cases where they, they at least had some hope. But the true mark of leprosy here is the exposure of raw flesh. You notice that? The Scripture has lots to say about the flesh. And as you quickly grasp, it's not flesh in the, in the, in the denotative sense, it's flesh in a connotative sense. God looked upon the earth and it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth in Genesis 6, 12. In John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are the spirit and they are the life. And of course, Romans 7, 18, you have to throw into this list. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present in me, but how to perform that which, I, which is good I find not. In 1 Corinthians 1, 29, it's also in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, that no flesh should glorify in his presence. We hear that again and again. And uh, Philippians 3, 3, for we are circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the what? In the flesh, right on. Jude 23, the others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spoiled by the flesh. See, the flesh can never please God. That's the point. The flesh is the old nature that we've all inherited genetically. It was that flesh that was judged on the cross. Well, the next section deals with a boil or a burn. Verse 18, the flesh also in which even the skin thereof has a boil and is healed, the place where the boil there be a white rising or a bright spot, white and somewhat reddish, is to be showed to the priest. And if when the priest sees it, behold, it be in sight lower than the skin, and the hair thereof be turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean, as a plague of leprosy broken out of the boil. But if the priest look, up, look on it, and behold, there be no white hairs therein, and if it not be lower than the skin, be somewhat dark, then the priest shall shut him up for seven days. And if it spread abroad, much abroad in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a plague. But if the bright spots stay in its place and spread not, it is a burning boil, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Even a small sore can become cancerous, obviously. And if it's penetrated lower than the skin, you see, it could mean very deep-seated trouble. You know, trying to apply this to our lives, old habits can return and become very malignant. Verse 24, if there be any flesh in the skin whereof there is a hot burning, and the quick flesh that burneth have a, a white bright spot, somewhat reddish or white, then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if hair in the bright spot be turned white, and it be in sight deeper than the skin, it is a leprosy broken out of the burning, wherefore, wherefore the priest shall pronounce him unclean as a plague of leprosy. But if the priest look on it, and behold, there be no white hair in the bright spot, and, be, and no lower than the other skin, but be somewhat dark, and the priest shall shut him up seven days, and the priest shall look upon him the seventh day, and it be uh, spread much abroad in the skin, and then the priest shall pronounce him unclean as a plague of leprosy. And if the bright spot stay in his place, and spread not in the skin, but be somewhat dark, it is a rising of the burning, and the priest shall pronounce him clean, for it is an inflammation of the burning. What it's really saying is the flesh needs to be kept under close observation. For it too, our flesh, not speaking leprosy, but our flesh, can also break out in an alarming matter. Manner. Romans 6, 19, Paul says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members as servants to righteousness and to holiness. And he goes on in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, But I keep, my, I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means... When I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Got to be on your guard continually. That's your spiritual hygiene, to really keep an eye on the flesh. 
Verse 29, if a man or woman have a plague upon the head or, or the beard, we now we're talking about, then the priest shall see the plague, and behold, it is a sight deeper than the skin. If a yellow thin hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a dry skull, and even a leprosy upon the head or beard. In other words, it can break out in unlikely spots. See, in a yellow hair, it implied that it had gotten, the infection got beneath the epidermis and it could be leprosy. Doesn't mean it is, but it could be. Verse 31, And if the priest look upon the plague of the skull, and behold, it be not in sight deeper than the skin, and there is no black hair in it, then the priest shall shut him up that hath the plague of skull for seven days. And in the seventh day, the priest shall look upon the plague, um, and so when the skull spread not, and there be no yellow hair, then the skull uh, be not in sight deeper than the skin, he shall be shaven. But the skull shall he not sh uh, shave. And the priest shall shut him up that hath the skull seven days more. And the seventh day the priest shall look upon the skull. And behold, if the skull be not spread under in the skin or be in sight deeper than the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. He shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the skull spread much in the skin after his cleansing, then the priest shall look upon him. And behold, if the skull is spread in the skin, the priest shall not seek for yellow hair. He is unclean. But if the skull be in his sight uh, at a stay, and that there is a black hair grown up therein, the skull is healed and he is clean. The priest shall pronounce him clean. So these verses show, in other words, it could, it might not be leprosy. I'm putting it in per personal terms, accusations need to be very cautious. Verse 38, if a man or a woman have in the skin of their flesh bright spots, even white bright spots, then the priest shall look and behold, if the bright spots in the skin of their flesh be darkish white, the freckled spot that groweth in the skin, and he is clean. The man whose hair has fallen off his head, he is bald, yet he is clean. And he that has his hair fallen off from the part of his head toward his face, he is forehead bald, he is yet clean. And uh, if there be a, uh, in the bald head or bald forehead a white reddish sore, it is a leprosy sprung up in the bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if it rising is of the sore be white reddish in his bald head or his bald forehead, as the leprosy peereth in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague is in his head. Now we deal with the disposal of garments. The leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, his head bare, and he shall put on a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. And that's his occupation for the rest of his days. See, the sinner, too, spreads his sin wherever he goes. And his disease, too, the sinner's disease, is contagious and infects others. Moving on to verse 46. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him shall be defi he is defiled, he is unclean, he shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his uh, habitation be. The garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be woolen garment or a linen garment, whether it be a warp, woof, or linen, or woolen, whether it be skin or anything else made of skin, if the plague be greenish or reddish in the garment or of the skin, either in the warp or the woof or anything in the skin, it is a plague of leprosy. It shall be showed unto the priest. The priest shall look upon the plague and shut it up that hath the plague seven days. And he shall look on the plague on the seventh day, and the plague be spread in the garment, either the warp or the woof and so forth. Um, it is unclean and uh, Therefore, he'll burn the garment, whether it's warp or woof, woolen, and so forth, so forth. And he'll be burnt with fire. Verse 53, if the priest shall look and behold, the plague be not spread in the garment, either in the warp or the woof, anything in the skin. And the priest shall command that they wash the thing wherein the plague is, and he shall shut up seven days more. And the priest shall look on the plague after that is washed, and behold, if the plague have not changed its color, the plague is not spread, it is unclean. Thou shalt burn it with fire, if it is Fret inward, whether it be bare within or without. If the priest look and behold the plague be somewhat dark after the washing of it, then he shall rend it out of the garment and out of the skin, out of the warp and out of the woof. And if it appear still in the garment, either in the warp or woof, or in any thing of skin which is spreading plague, thou shalt burn that wherein the plague is with fire. And the garment with the warp or woof and so forth. On it goes. It's, it, it goes on that way. See, the quality of the garment made no difference. Now, what's the, how does that apply to us? Well, I'll just use, I'll retreat to Isaiah 64, 6. Our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags is the way it's translated in the King James. You know what the Hebrew really says? Used menstrual cloths. Isn't that graphic? Well, let's move on to chapter 14. This is now about the ceremonial. We've talked about diagnosis. This is all diagnosis so far. Now we're going to talk about this, the cleansing. But it's talking ceremonial cleansing. And we're not talking about cure here. Cleansing cures after the cure. 
Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. In other words, he's, this is not curing him. He's somehow had a cure. We're going to cleanse him ceremonially here. He shall be brought into the priest. The priest shall go forth out of the camp. Why is he doing that? Because he can't come into the camp yet. He may be clean, he may, but he hasn't been ceremonially cleansed. So the priest has to go to him. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He came to us, became a man and dwelt among us. The priest shall go forth out of the camp. The priest shall look and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. <laughs> now notice he's not going out to heal the leper. He's going out to see if he has been healed. The ceremony follows the cure. And uh, of course the priest has to go to him as, as, as Hebrews 2 and elsewhere. You can lots of quotes there. Remember in, in, in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's coming to you in effect. Verse 4, Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds, alive and clean, and cedarwood, and scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedarwood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. So this, the, you see, the leper was shut out of the tabernacle. This had to be done out in the field. And two birds, one for death, one for resurrection. That's what they're typifying. And the blood of the dead one is put on the living one to get him to identify. So you're identifying them as one. One dies, and then he's resurrected. And scarlet means faith in the blood. You can think of examples of that throughout the scripture. For Rahab, it's evidence of faith in the blood, was the scarlet thread she hung from a window so when they attacked Jericho, they would know that she was to be spared. We all use the expression, free as a bird, isn't it? Right? That's what this bird means in terms of its being turned loose. It's now free of sin, free of the leprosy, whatever. And that's exactly this idea. It's a symbol of liberty, if you will. And stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and hath not in, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Paul tells the Galatians in chapter five. Well, that's the trick. Hebrews six and ten touch on this too. Once you had a taste of it, don't fall back into it. Living water and blood, of course, meet in this ceremony. And they also do in John the water and the blood from Christ when it is pierced his side. And in 1 John 5, 6, and so on. Let's move on. Verse 8. And he that is cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean. I thought he's already cured. Yes, he is. Well, why is he doing all this? Well, for, a lot, for ceremonial reasons. And after that he shall come to the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. And it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave off his head and his beard and his eyebrows. Even his eyebrows. Wow. Even all his hair he shall save, shave off. And he shall wash his clothes. Also, he shall wash his flesh in water and shall be clean. See, clothes represent the habits of life. We speak of a, a habit as a, as a synonym for one's dress, right? So clothes speak of his habits or his lifestyle. Shaving off the hair was to call attention to a radical and revolutionary change in his life. That's, what, that's the purpose of it. And uh, John 15, 3 comes to mind. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, Jesus says. Moving on, verse 10, and on the eighth day, new, be eighth, new beginning, on the eighth day he shall take two lambs without blemish and one new lamb of the first year without blemish and three tenth deals of flour and for a meal offering. It says meat offering, but that's again King James-ish. Mingled with oil and one log of oil. And by the way, the next ten verses are a single sentence, <laughs> in the, at least in the translation. The priests that make them clean shall present the man that is to be clean, uh, those things before the Lord, the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall take one he lamb and offer him for a trespass offering, the log of oil, and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord, and he shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering, it is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. You remember this from before, right? You know, the ear for the listening, and the, the uh, right thumb of hand for service, and the, and the right toe of his feet for the walk, if you will. It's, it, it, it's idiomatic, of course. And the priest shall uh, take some of the log of the coil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand, and the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in the left hand, and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. 
Boy, he must have a big palm. That must be a lot of oil. Anyway, and the, uh, the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put upon the tip of his right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and of the great toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering, and the remnant of the oil that is in the priest's hand shall he pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed, and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. And the priest shall offer the sin offering, and make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed for his uncleanness. And afterward he shall kill the burnt offering, and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the meat offering upon the altar, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Familiar stuff to us in terms of the style here in Leviticus. Um, but verse 20 on, now we're going to talk about the poor. We always make, always make provision for the poor. The poor it cannot get so much, then he shall take one lamb for a trespass offering to be waived, to make atonement for him, and one-tenth deal of flour mingled with oil for the meat offering, a log of oil, and two turtle doves and two pigeons, as, as, much, as such as he'd be able to get. And one shall be a sin offering, the other a burnt offering, and then shall bring them on the eighth day for cleansing the priest under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering, the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest shall pour the oil upon the palm of his own left hand, and shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. And the priest shall... And anyway, it goes on, obviously, quite in parallel uh, to the previous one, right down to verse 32. This is the law of him in whom is the plague of leprosy, whose hand is not able to get that which pertaineth to his cleansing. Verse 33 talks about the cleansing of a house. The Lord spake unto Moses under the Aaron, saying, Come ye into the land of Canaan, I give you for a possession, I, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession. And he that owneth the house shall come, tell the priest, saying, It seemeth to me there is a plague in the house. The priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest go into it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be not made unclean. And afterward the priest shall go in and see the house, and he shall look upon the plague, and behold, the plague be in the walls of the house with hollow strakes and greenish or reddish, which inside are lower than the wall. Then the, the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again in the seventh day and look, and behold, if the plague is spread in the walls of the house, and the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city or outside the city. And he shall cause the house to be scraped with a roundabout, and they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off without the city into an unclean place. And they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house, and the plague shall come again. They shall break out in the house all that he hath taken away of the stones, and after he had scraped the house, after it was plastered, and the priest shall come and look, and behold, the plague is spread in the house. It is spreading leprosy in the house. It is unclean. He shall break down the house and the stones of it, the timber of it, and all the mortar of the house, and he shall carry them forth out of the city into a clean place. Moreover, he that goeth into the house, all the while that is shut up, shall be unclean until evening. And he that lieth in the house shall wash his clothes, and eateth in the house shall wash his clothes. And if the priest come in and look upon it, the plague hath not spread in the house. After the house was plastered, the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. And he shall... Take to cleanse the house two birds in the cedar wood and scarlet. See, bear in mind, this is ceremonial cleansing we're talking about here. And shall kill the, one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water, and he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the living bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the running water and the living bird and, and so on, right on through uh, to the end. It's interesting here you know, to realize that all these procedures that we're getting exposed to are ceremonial. They're important to do. They're commanded by God. But they are after the cure. You know, it's interesting. We will pray diligently for a success of an operation or the deliverance from some kind of malady. And we rejoice when God hears that. But there should be more than, more than just that, you see. All this that's going on goes on after the person has been healed from leprosy. It's not what heals them. It's their way of, of dramatizing their recognition that leprosy is a type of sin. And we need to do the same thing. Not that, sin, you know, not that a specific sin causes us to be sick. We can be sick for many reasons. However, when God cures us, we should do more than just, oh, praise the Lord, period. It might be a, it's an appropriate time for some fasting and praying and being serious about acknowledging that we're delivered, not just from the sin, whatever it might have been, the virus, whatever, but from all the rest of it that the cross purchased for us. That, I think, is part of the message here. But anyway, we get to the verse, uh, chapter 15, which now deals with something really grotesque. And it's just going to be talked here in sort of a collective term called running issues. 
But as we go through, you can fill in the blanks yourself without me getting too graphic. You see, when we, as we study sin, which is the subject in these three chapters, human nature is not only defiled, human nature does the defiling. It's not that we are subject to sin, it's that we ourselves cause other people to get defiled. In other words, we are a carrier, not just a recipient, we're a generator of it. And by the way, leprosy is a, a sin that cannot be kept secret for very long. But we have in our nature hidden sins that may not be visible at all. And that's what we're going to start to deal with here, the internal sins. The secret sins are what's in view in chapter 15. It's amazing to realize how many secular authors have commented on this sort of thing. Goethe said, I see no fault committed which I too might not have committed. That's quite an admission. Samuel Johnson said, every man knows of himself which he dares not tell his dearest friends. Conte Mystery said, I do not know what the heart of a villain may be. I only know that of a virtuous man, and that is frightful. Interesting twist on that, isn't it? Shakespeare said, go to your own bosom, not there, and ask your heart what it doth know. I think that's all Shakespearean. And Seneca says, why is there no man who confesses his vices? It is because he has not yet laid them aside. It is a waking man only who can tell his dreams. <laughs> Interesting. You see, we, we talk a lot today about the new morality. That's the buzzword in the secular world. We're in a new morality. It's interesting that the new morality is delivering the same old diseases of the old morality, immorality, if you will. Anyway, let's move on. Verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue he is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in his issue. Whether his flesh run with his issue, or whether the flesh be stopped with the issue, it is his uncleanness. Now this vivid language all through is going to get increasingly sickening, disgusting, abhorrent, offensive, impure, repugnant, utterly corrupt and corrupting, which is exactly what human nature is. It's the pus of sin flowing from the human heart. It's everywhere around us. We all influence each other. We're all preachers. Not just the guy up here behind the pulpit. All of us are preachers, whether we know it or not. We are preaching with our lives. Verse 4, Every bed whereupon he lieth that he hath the issue is unclean. Everything whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the, till the evening. And he that sitteth on anything whereon he sat that hath the issue, shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until evening. And he that touches the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. See, everything he touches is unclean. And the running sores we're talking about here, the running issues are hidden sins. Verse 8, And if he that hath the issue spit upon him that is clean, he shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until evening. And what saddle whosoever he, sit, he rideth upon that hath the issue shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth anything that was under him shall be unclean until evening. And he that beareth any of those things that shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. And whosoever touch, he toucheth that hath the issue and hath not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. The vessel of the earth that he touches that hath the issue shall be broken and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed with water. Talking about sin, sin here, hold oh, this by accidental contact. It's everywhere. How can you avoid it? Well, Psalm 119, verse 9 gives a suggestion Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Jesus said in John 15, as I said before, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. When he prays to the Father in John 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Well, continuing verse 13, And he that hath the issue is cleansed out of his issue, and he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take to him two turtle doves and two young pigeons, and come before the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and give them unto the priest. The priest shall offer one of them, one for the sin offering, one for the burnt offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord for his issue. Well, what's our application? 
Well, we have a very simple one that we can just take refuge in. That's 1 John 1, 9, the Christian's bar of soap. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why can He do that? Because He shed His blood on the cross on our behalf, fulfilling all those examples that we went through in the first half a dozen chapters of this book. Continuing in verse 16, If any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until evening. And every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation shall be washed in water and be unclean until the evening. And the woman also with whom the man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until evening. And also what's lurking behind all this, of course, is venereal diseases. It's amazing how man is always debasing himself in what was supposed to be one of man's noblest experiences. Verse 19, And if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. Whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean till evening, and everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean till evening. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. And if it be on her bed or anything whereon she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean till evening. And every man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him. He shall be unclean seven days, and the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. If a woman have an issue of blood, many days out of her time of separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of her issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth in the days of her issue shall be unto her the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. On the eighth day she shall take unto her two turtle doves, two young pigeons, and bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall offer one of them for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her issue of uncleanness. She's, in other words, treated as an outcast. Numbers 5.2 hammers that home. A reminder, if you will, of the fall of man in Genesis. Now, as we read this, we can begin to grasp, perhaps, the plight of the woman that we find in Mark 5 or Matthew 9 or Luke 8. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. So we won't take the time to look it up. You can look it up in either Matthew 9, Mark 5, or Luke 8. You may recall that Jesus was on his way to raise Jairus, his daughter. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus was on his way to raise Jairus' daughter. And on the way in the crowd, this woman who had spent all her life savings, she had this issue of blood, not for a few weeks, for 12, for 12 years. Spent all her life savings with physicians uselessly. But she had resolved if she could just touch the hem of his garment. Now, I don't understand, you have to understand the hems was the, the place of authority. Just like we have a shoulder patch for soldiers or, you know, you know, a bars on a shoulder for an officer or whatever. In those days, your rank was on the hem of your garment. And the embroidery or the pattern indicated your station. It was a source of your authority. That's where Saul had his, his, his authority's king on the hem. That's why David cut off his hem to, and then later regretted it and so forth. Anyway, um, so she resolved. If she could just touch the hem, she would be healed. And she did, and she was. He turned around, and her faith made her whole. You know the story. And then he goes on to raise Jairus' daughter. Well, first of all, you can begin to understand the plight she's in. She's obviously not Jewish or she couldn't be in the crowd. She was a Gentile. Oh, a Gentile woman. And then Mark throws a little corkscrew at us because he ties the two together. Because how old is Jairus that was the young daughter? She's 12 years old. So you begin to link. Jesus is on his way to raise the daughter of Jerusalem, if you will. And uh, on the way by faith incidental to that trip, so to speak. He raises a Gentile to health. Interesting. It's exactly what Jesus did. He came to his own, and his own received him up. But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become what? Born again, the sons of God, a new creation. Now, there's much to that. I'll let you immerse that in, in that yourself. Let's go on to verse 31. Thus shall he separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness. When they defile my tabernacle, it's among them. This is the law of him that hath an issue. 
of him whose seed goeth forth from him and is defiled therewith. And of her that is sick of her flowers and of him that hath an issue of the man and of the woman of him that lieth with her uh, that is unclean. Well, anyway, the gist of all of this, of course, is that hidden sin is not a trivial matter with God. God does not wink at sin. And this gets especially driven home in the New Testament because in 1 Corinthians 3, in fact, seven times in the New Testament, it says, you are the temple of God. I wonder what that means. 1 Corinthians 3 amplifies this. It says, know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Boy, do we need to understand that. You know, somehow if we really grasp that, then everything else falls into place. If we really realize that we're not our own, we're purchased. See, God, the term that the scripture uses many places, we're purchased. We belong to him. And we are not to defile his goods. We're stewards of that. We've sort of accelerated through these three chapters, trying to figure out how to close this, because it's pretty disgusting stuff. Going through the depress- you know, you'll, you'll probably have dreams tonight of people with their fingers falling off and who can't talk because they have no palate. There's just a, a rattle from their throat when they try to communicate. You'll have these grotesque notions perhaps following you through your sleep if you don't get your mind off this passage of Scripture. But on the one hand, that's its purpose. If this has been particularly shocking, particularly repulsive, particularly offensive, that's God's intention. That's why leprosy is chosen as a type of sin, because sin is offensive. It's offensive to us as we begin to understand it, but not nearly as offensive as this to God, a pure and holy God. It falls so far from His desire for us, His destiny that He would have for us. And so... When we see the blood of the offerings all through the earlier chapters, as we, as we watch the grotesqueness of these horrible debilitating diseases and realize even beyond the disease itself, it's idiomatic, if you will, of the sin. But at the same time, having gone through this, let's realize that Jesus Christ, that's why he died to die. That's why he's on the cross, is to deliver us from all this. And praise God that his, by his stripes we indeed are healed. And how, you know, the the joy of all this is as we begin to really come to grips with the heinousness of sin, we begin to, begin to grasp the beauty of our Savior. The awesome, awesome gift that He has arranged for us. The gift of His life. For a closing thought on your way home, I thought I'd just remind you of Philippians 4.8. If you possibly can, after this grisly, gloomy, disgusting Bible study, I hope it was the most disgusting Bible study you ever attended because that was what it was supposed to be, at least by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'll tell hide behind him for that one. Let's focus on Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, one of the things lately, the Lord's blessed us so much. There's so many incidents that have occurred in the last several days in the ministry that have just been so encouraging. I stopped it out a very high pressure day in one hand, on the other hand, I had a chance just to stop, spend some time. Just in 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 praise. I'm not a singer. I'm not a poet. I just poured myself out before the Lord. How how precious He is. How how visible is His handiwork. How how gracious is His encouragements and in, in in His provision for us all. So we're in some pretty tough stuff with uh, Leviticus, and that's appropriate because God is a holy God, and He's getting across to us just how holy He is. Holy He is by giving us a perspective of how far we are from where He is. Okay, that's great. We need to, we need to embrace that and understand it. But at the same time, let's shift gears a little bit and let's really focus on Him.